Hey guys, um, I have a quick question. How many people here already felt their phone vibrating in their pocket, took it out, and there was nothing on it? Right? Yeah, okay. So that's actually something that's called phantom vibrations. It's literally when you imagine your phone vibrating when in fact nothing happened. <laughs> so, yeah, it's funny, right? Nine out of 10 people already experienced that, which I find completely insane. Do you know what's another word for that? Can you guess? A hallucination, yes. <laughs> like, what happened in this world that we got so conditioned by technology that we're imagining things that doesn't exist? Like, that for me is a big issue. And the reason why this is happening is because for the past decades, we've had as humans to learn how each of those machines worked. So you had to make the intellectual effort of learning the interface of each of those machines you wanted to use. Your coffee machine, your washing machine, your TV, your car, your phone, every app on your phone. And so the more technology we want to use, the harder it becomes to actually use technology because our brain becomes saturated. And so we build all of those coping mechanisms where we're creating shortcuts that is literally, us, literally turning us into robots ourselves. So when you think about what's happening in the future where everything around you is going to be connected, every chair, lamp, every table, if all of these things require you to make an effort, it's never going to work. And this is precisely what I'm convinced AI, in particular voice, can actually solve. Because if you can speak to machines like you speak to a human, then you don't care anymore about how it works. You can ask it what you want. And so all of a sudden, all of this technology becomes a lot easier to use. You're democratizing access to it, so anybody who can speak and use technology equally well, but you're making it so easy and intuitive that eventually it becomes like electricity, somewhere, something that's all over the place that you don't have to think about. It literally disappears from your consciousness. So this is really you know, what the vision we have behind the company, what's been driving us for the past few years, is we're trying to basically put an AI assistant in every device on the planet so that people can stop thinking about it and can disappear into the background. So why voice in particular? Well, it turns out that people have been thinking about those things for 20 years. Go talk to any big company. You had some you know, ergonomics people tell you that voice was amazing. The problem is that the technology didn't work. But recently, it started booming. With all those new advances in deep learning, all the data accessible, we finally built voice assistants that could not only understand what we're saying, but also interpret what we're saying in a good way. And so we're seeing a very, very fast growth, actually 3x year on year growth in the number of voice devices, which means that by 2021, we're expecting between two and three billion devices that you can control by voice. This is, by the way, faster than the smartphone grew when it got introduced. So this is staggering. I've never seen this in the 15 years I've been doing those things. Uh, everybody knows about those kind of voice assistants. How many people here own a uh, kind of Google Home or Alexa device? Yeah. I heard the statistics, which, which is crazy. 90% of North American households, so San Francisco basically, got one in their house. 90%. And they've not even launched in most countries yet. This is insane. But this is just scratching the surface. You're not gonna have three billion of those devices. A trend we see happening a lot right now is the verticalization of voice assistants. So everything from you know, your speakers to control music, to your TV, to actually Comcast already does that, it's pretty impressive. To your car, all of these devices will have their own voice assistants. And the reason is quite simple. If you are a car company, or if you are you know, a coffee machine company, you don't want to be marketing your product as being voice controlled if that means buying another product, and by the way, giving control of the user to Amazon or Google. So you're seeing a lot of these big companies, traditional product companies, starting to put a voice assistant into their own products. So this is a space we're working in. As a company at SNPs, what we're doing is that we're actually selling this voice technology. So whether you're a developer, a maker, someone building a physical product, if you want to integrate voice into it, we sell the entire st stack to do that. Think about it as a kind of white, lab white label Alexa for your products. There are multiple steps involved in voice. The first one is getting actual clean voice. People underestimate how difficult it is to actually get clean voice through a microphone. Most of the time, when a device doesn't work, it's not because the AI part didn't work, it's because the microphone was so bad that it just literally could not get enough of the good sound to retranscribe it. So if you're gonna build a device like that, figure out the good microphone that goes with it. The second part is called wake word detection. So this is when someone says Alexa or hey Siri or you know, okay Google. Yeah, 
right? So lots of them just triggered. Uh, so whenever someone does that, you want the assistant that's listening 24 seven to pick up on that word and basically say, okay, someone's talking to me. Once you've done this, there's another model which is called speech recognition. The idea here is that you're taking the sound of the voice and you're retranscribing that sound into text. Once you've done this, you've gotta do something called natural language understanding, which is taking that piece of text and extracting the intention of the user and what he actually meant and what he was asking about. So if you're building chatbots, you can forget the first three parts and focus on the rest of it. It would be equivalent technology. Once you've got the natural language, you wanna engage in dialogue. If someone's saying, hey, I want a pizza, you don't know what kind of pizza, you wanna reply back saying, what kind of pizza? So you have a loop going back to the speech recognition and doing this whole thing. And then finally, on the far end, you either want to do some kind of actions, order the actual pizza, or maybe speak back to the user, which is something called text-to-speech. Every one of those steps requires different models. Every one of those steps uses machine learning in a different way. So if you're gonna build a complete stack for voice, you gotta be good at every single piece there. Because if your wake word doesn't work well, or your speech recognition doesn't work well, or your natural language understanding doesn't work well, or your microphone doesn't work well, well, your product just doesn't work, period. Right, the, the compounding error is actually pretty big. So we do all of that, right? But there's a lot of us now in the company. The one thing in particular, and th I promise this is the only very technical slide, right? But one thing that we do in particular, which is quite different, is something we call specialized speech recognition. So typically, when you use other platforms, what happens is they have one model to transcribe your voice into text, and then another one to do the natural language understanding. So these two are completely decoupled. But we thought, hey, if you're talking to a coffee machine, and that coffee machine knows the number of capa like the capabilities it has, why wouldn't you use that information to help the speech recognition part understand what someone is saying? Because the likelihood of me asking my coffee machine about the weather is zero if my coffee machine is not supposed to answer about the weather. And so using the natural language understanding information, you can bias the AI to recognize your voice much, much better from much longer distances, right? So it's a very complicated process. It's actually not just a neural network. It's a neural network that feeds into an HMM, that feeds into an NLU. I mean, it's very, very complicated stuff, but it's super cool to work on and definitely one of the biggest challenges we have today. But the important trick here is you're actually coupling the NLU and the speech recognition together to build a much more intelligent and robust voice assistance. Uh, we've made all of that available through our website. So if you wanna build your own voice assistant, you can go on snips.ai, you can create your own intents, put in your few examples, tag them, train an assistant to do whatever you want it to do. Uh, and we actually also added a uh, capability for people to publish what they've been building so that people can reuse them. So we've got a pretty active community. We launched a website back in June. We've got over 5,000 5, developers and makers. They've built over 13,000 voice assistants. So we have a very, very active community. It's really nice to see that people are really interested in building those different things. There is one issue though, right? And I don't know if you've been thinking about this with voice assistant, is that if you're gonna build a device which is sitting in your house listening to every single conversation, then you've got a very big privacy problem. Google, you know, a month ago had a problem with a new Google Home Mini. They gave a few samples to people to try, but there was a hardware bug that made the device think you were talking to it all the time, when in fact you were not. And so what does it do when it thinks you're talking to it? Well, it records what you're saying. It sends that to the cloud, and it gets recorded and stored on Google server. Now, think about it this way. If Google could not build a device without a bug like that, what is the probability that the hundreds of other companies building voice devices for your home are not gonna have a bug like that? Yeah, zero. Like, you're guaranteed that one company is gonna have an issue like that in the future, right? Nobody's gonna do better than Google at writing software, period, right? You gotta get used to that idea. And so privacy becomes an integral part of the way you have to think about those things, because today more than 48% of people are freaking out about the privacy with the voice assistants. So how do you solve this privacy issue? Well, the good thing is that in Europe, or if you're an American company who actually want to sell your voice assistant product in Europe, you kind of have no choice. There is a new regulation called the GDPR. Who has heard about the GDPR? That's actually very good, I'm, I'm really impressed. So the GDPR, think of it as the Y2K bug of data, right? Is this huge privacy regulation that applies to all of Europe that forces any company anywhere in the world, America, China, Europe, 
who wants to sell a product or service to European resident to follow privacy by design principles. If you don't do that, you can either not sell your product in Europe or you can get fined 4% of global turnover. It's huge. Yeah, yeah, it's a massive, massive big deal. So you really got to get on that, right? Uh, one thing in particular in the GDPR is that you need to ask for explicit consent when you're handling personal data. Voice is personal data, which means that a device which is listening ambiently has in theory to ask consent to every person in the room before it can record anything. What happens when you've got a dinner at home and you've got you know, 10 people coming over and each of them has to give consent to your you know, Amazon Echo or Google Home? It doesn't work, right? There is like a fundamental problem. So for us as a company, it was very obvious that we needed to solve the privacy issue as we were building our technology. And so the way we did this is by very simply doing all the computation on the device directly. So we actually don't do anything in the cloud. Everything I showed you, the entire voice pipeline, the speech recognition, all the deep neural nets, the NLU, every single piece of the puzzle is running on the device that you're talking to directly. There is not a single piece of data. Your voice never, ever gets sent to the cloud. And as a matter of fact, we've been able to optimize this so much that we can run this in a Raspberry Pi. So we're not talking $1,000 iPhone X computer, right? We're talking a single core ARM7 $10 computer, right? Super, super basic stuff. So just think about this. Next time someone tells you you need enormous processing power to do voice, that's actually not true. Right? And for those interested, we do all that in Rust, which is a pretty cool language as well. So anyway, one problem when you do things on device is, can you guess, what's the problem if we actually don't get any data as a company? Well, we can't train our models, right? Like the, the sort of, the sort of trade-off people have been, the trade-off people have been wanting us to do was, hey, give me your data, I'm gonna give you a better service. Well, it turns out that for voice assistants, you don't need to do that. We actually found a way to train our models and to make them perform extremely well without any real user data. This is something that we call data generation. Instead of relying on real user, what we do is we simply generate fake data. We build the data sets we need to train the models. And we do this using a human in the loop algorithm. So the way that it works is you go on the website, you create a specific intent, so a capability for your assistant, you describe it, you give 10 examples, click a button, come back a few hours later, and we generated hundreds or thousands of examples of people actually interacting with your assistant. And so in the span of a few hours, you've got literally the equivalent of months and months of real users, right, who interacted with your product. Not only does it solve your privacy issue, it solves all of your day zero issue, because at the end of the day, nobody actually ever spoken to a coffee machine in Chinese or Japanese, I don't know, like uh, they say randomly. So even if you were Google, you still would not have that data. When you generate data, well, you don't have to care about not having it because you can just build it from scratch. We're actually launching this as a service. As of next week, you'll be able to generate your own data on our platform, either use it with your own assistant, or you can actually export it and use it for your chatbot or whatever other NLU you want to do that might not be covered by our products. So I had, oh yeah, this is very important. This is just to show you the difference when you start using data generation. We've compared our NLU engine versus pretty much everything else that people use. So Dialogflow, uh, Wid.ai, Lewis.ai, even Alexa. And with data generation, you can get much higher performances. Quite simply, because as a developer, if you have to sit down and actually write down examples of people talking to your assistant, how many are you gonna think about? 100 at most, we can generate tens of thousands for you if you want. So think about it this way, right? Data generation is a much better way to actually do NLU than getting real data. So I had a demo, unfortunately it doesn't work, but we are publishing, the, we're, so sorry, the video doesn't work. So we are publishing next week. It's, uh, this is actually pretty cool, it's a hack that we did, using a Raspberry Pi to control your Sono system by voice. Uh, so you can do this at home, you know, it's very cheap to build, it's very easy. I mean, I'm pretty sure most people here will do it like in less than an hour. Uh, it'll be a great occasion for you to try out a platform as well. Thanks. Very nice, thank you. What, what are some um, interesting use cases that developers have come up with? Yeah. In the so, 
we've got uh, two types of people using our technology. On one end, we've got a very active community of developers and makers who are building all kinds of really interesting things. So lots and lots of things for the home, of course, right? So home automation, uh, uh, voice assistance. Someone's building a voice controlled um, a crossword game, right? So people are not just doing voice, they're coupling it with a bunch of other things. They're hooking it up to a screen, they're hooking it up to like a robot. It's pretty amazing what people do. Lots of things, lots of people actually build stuff for their kids, which I find quite interesting. I think there is a pretty interesting big market there. And on the other side, we've got our enterprise customers. So these are like companies building physical products that they want to integrate voice into. Uh, you know, music speakers, cars, televisions, and this we've seen it's crazy. Like, I cannot tell you how crazy it is how many companies right now are rushing to add voice into their products. And companies you would never suspect would be that cutting edge. But they've been, they've been thinking about this for years. They've been waiting for the technology to actually work. So like, they already know how they want to integrate it. It's really amazing what it can do right now. Um, so currently we can, so you have to distinguish the speech recognition part from the NLU, right? Uh, for the speech recognition, you only got to train the model once for every language. So you just need, honestly, you just need to buy the data, right? It, it just costs like hundreds of thousands of dollars per language to get something robust, but it's just a money problem, so like you can solve it with more money basically, right? It's not a science problem, that's what I'm saying. The NLU is more tricky because the NLU, you need data for each use case that you want to handle with the NLU. So if you're building you know, a chatbot or a voice assistant for a coffee machine, you need data, not speech data, but you need like uh, NLU data of the coffee machine. And so this is where data generation is really, really bringing a lot of value is to generate NLU data. And so the way we do it, which is extremely complicated, it involves a combination of algorithms, machine learning, and humans operators. Right? So it's not just that you can ask random people, how do you ask about the weather in London? Because if I ask every one of you to do that, the distribution of samples I'm getting is like gonna be very narrow towards the way that most people say it. Right? So you're actually not gonna get a lot of variability in the data set you're creating. So the first problem we solved is generating data, which is a lot more uniformly distributed over the space of every possible way that you could ask something to your device. Right, so I cannot explain how we do it, obviously, uh, but just know that these are the problems you gotta figure out. There's also the quality problem. You know, how do you know that what you generated is actually good enough? So we actually use machine learning to figure out which are the samples which might be a little bit uh, bad quality and we ask people to validate them. So there is actually like a kind of like machine learning pass after everything. There's like a bunch of things. It's, it took us a year to build. How do you solve the uh, NLU problem for narrow domain spaces where you're giving data and high specificity of terminologies and things that it's taking and sets up on college and they're taking yeah. feedback and less? Well, actually, this is precisely why the, uh, the specialized ASR is super powerful. Uh, so, what you would do is in your NLU, you would create an intent for whatever domain you want to build, then you would give a dictionary of entities. Right, so these could be all of your medical terms. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna use all that information to bias the speech recognition model to actually understand when you're speaking those words that are actually included in your dictionary of entities. So this tight coupling makes it a lot more effective. Uh, but there is, uh, there is an entity list at some point that's included in the NLU. It's not like, we're not trying to solve general purpose NLU, we're trying very, very specifically to solve Here's an assistant that does one specific thing and it has to do it super well. It's not trying to understand a big text, it's trying to understand queries. And that's a very different problem from trying to understand or summarize text or something like that. Thank you very much. Thank you.